So my guest today is Dan Hill, who's a PhD and author of nine books, including Emotionomics, which was an advertising age top 10 must read selection and features a forward from Sam Simon, co-creator of The Simpsons. Uh, Dan founded Sensory Logic whose clients include over 50% of the world's top 10 advertisers. He's pioneered the use of facial coding in business to capture and quantify consumer responses, has seven U.S. patents for scoring methods for the tool The Economist has dubbed central to the emerging facial industrial complex. And by the way, his newest book, blah, 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 I love that title, a snarky guide to office lingo is a fun read. Enjoy it. It's it. I really enjoyed reading. It was a lot of fun. Dan, welcome. Thank you so much for welcoming me to the show. I would mention, by the way, one correction. It's actually the top 100 advertisers, not the top 10. Yeah. Ooh, thank you for the correction. My apologies. <laughs> no, quite all right. Every once in a while, you'll read something and it, it comes out of the mouth a little weird. <laughs> uh, that's quite all right. Top 10 wouldn't be necessarily quite as impressive and maybe harder to make a living by. <laughs> I agree with you. So, Dan, let me ask a question. How, does it, how do you think it feels to be in a job search when it's been going on for a while? Well, I think there are two principal emotions and they can both get you into trouble if you don't utilize them correctly. One is you're inevitably going to feel anger. Because anger as an emotion is about, I want to control my destiny and I want to make progress. Uh, you know better than I do the statistics on how it works to apply for jobs online with the online job banks and so forth is really arduous. You can throw in so many of those and it just doesn't seem to go anywhere. So anger that can really build in a sense that you are spinning out of control, you're in the fate, you know, the hands of fate and it's a cruel fate is, is really a tough thing. And so what you have to do is find some ways in which you can still feel like you do have some control of your destiny. Like I will do these number per week or per day. Uh, I'm going to make these adjustments or improvements or learnings from how I'm doing things. Some way in which you feel like you're honing your game, making progress, getting better at it. Because otherwise just being consumed by rage over this whole process will not be helpful. But there's a second emotion we can go to in a moment, perhaps. And, you know, I'm thinking back uh, to what you just said. You, you don't think rage works in a job search? <laughs> <laughs> we probably don't want to hire Jeffrey Dolmer. Yes, um, you, you, you don't want to come across as a psycho killer. Um, so if the rage starts to emerge, frustration, anger, irritation, uh, you know, is that the kind of coworker you want? You know, person on staff? Probably not. Uh, Self-directed, energetic, yes. Uh, crazy man, crazy woman, no. And you know, as, in a workshop that I, I led for quite a few years, the phrase I would use is, use it, don't abuse it. How do you take that energy that comes from anger, diffuse it, but use the good quality of it that's really about, you know, I'm frustrated, passionate. How do I, you know, get out of the expression of it, but take the energy and apply it to what you need to do next. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, because every emotion has an upside and a downside to it. And so, yes, we have movies like Anger Management, which makes it seem like anger is this curse. But as I'm alluding to, anger also has a benefit. It is that you, in fact, want to be self-initiating. You want to be proactive. You want to get someplace. And so, Harness it, but yes, don't abuse it. <laughs> now you mentioned there's a second emotion. Yeah, and I think this one's really crucial, particularly if the job search goes on for a while. I think you should think about a job search and joining a company very much in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. At the lowest level of that pyramid base is, I need a job. <laughs> I need security. I need food, shelter, you know, clothing. I, I got to survive here. Um, so that can induce fear. But as you move up through that ladder, there are two other things you're really hoping for. One is a chance to belong. And that's really crucial. And so now you're feeling like you're bereft, like you're alone. And just above that is you want esteem. Uh, because the job search can really batter you over time if seemingly no one, quote unquote, wants you. So I think the second emotion here, really important over time, is sadness. Because sadness is, 
I'm longing to be hugged. I'm longing to be included. I'm longing to join your company. And when you feel sad, and I know this from my work in pro sports, one of the things that happens is you slow down both mentally and physically. The very energy that anger can give you, sadness takes away from you. And you feel sad because you feel forlorn, you feel hopeless, <laughs> uh, you know, you don't think anything's going to turn out. And obviously, if that slows you to a crawl, yes, by definition, the job search is not going to go well because you're no longer actually engaged in a job search. You've been filled with despair and you've essentially dropped out. I've, uh, I've spent more than 20, 25 years facilitating psychodrama. And in doing yes. that, <laughs> one of the easiest ways to understand what's going on for someone is if they're... Uh, the emotion that they're expressing on top is anger, behind it is sadness. Conversely, if the thing that they're expressing is sadness, often what's behind it is extreme anger. So the two are looped together very tightly. They, they are, particularly they can do a job search because you'd like to get to happiness <laughs> eventually, but for a lot of the process, that's not really apropos. And you are so right. It's not that we have this emotion or that emotion. We tend to have blends of emotion and how they impact each other. What's the sequence? Does one dominate at certain stages in a job search? I mean, you're so spot on. And I'll throw in a third one, which is shame, which is, yeah. you know, often when you're, you think you've done well on interviews and you're disappointed with the decision, shame is often an emotion that people turn to. Uh, you know, I'm a failure, I'm a loser, all those other sorts of emotions that frankly is not particularly useful in getting to where you wanna to get to. Sure, and that brings in a third emotion because shame is derived in part from fear. You know, fear that I'm a loser. I, I remember so well, many years ago, I was doing a presentation for General Motors. They had put out a print ad that essentially apologized for their previous production errors, low quality. And it, it tested terribly among their, their loyal buyers because you're basically saying, I'm a loser and a fool because I bought your product. So I give the presentation on the way out, I'm going back to what I call the, the gerbil tube, which is back to the parking lot from the General Motors headquarters, the glass enclosed second floor walkway. I pass a young African-American woman in a t-shirt, a spangly t-shirt, and it has one word on it, winner. And Excellent. she probably isn't actually a winner in life, you know, odds are, but she wanted to be a winner. We all wanna be winners, but the fear of being the loser Sure, it has to build during the process of a, of a job search if it's not going well. And, and that's a terrible predicament because just as sadness brings you to a halt, fear can do it in a different way, which is you freeze up. Like, oh my God, if I take this next step, it could be a disaster. And yet you have to keep taking the next steps. It reminds me of the famous Amy Cuddy TED Talk, uh, where she talks about how her posture uh, how her behavior, it was fake it until you become it, uh, was her theme of trying to convert the feelings that she had uh, as someone who had a traumatic brain injury uh, and was trying to recover from that and through her behavior and adopting the, you know, the Superman pose and the, you know, the extreme pose <laughs> of sticking uh, her hand uh, her um, arms up in the air, yeah. as winners do when they cross the finish line often. Uh, well, know, emo emotions are very contagious. Uh, they can be contagious between people, certainly, but also for yourself. So you're right, you can play with that. When I, it, it was a version of a job search, I suppose, when I started my company, Sensory Logic, all those years ago, I wasn't used to being a pitch person. I'm someone who, when I got married, even though I was in front of my family and friends and relatives, I put my head down and I'm walking down the aisle and my dad's like, lift your head, Dan, lift your head. <laughs> Eye contact with people. But I was really shy. And when I started doing, you know, my version of a job search, which was finding clients, I remember so distinctly one day, a, a woman in, in Phoenix cut me off. She said, just spit it out, Dan. What are you trying to sell me? And <laughs> that was the last call I made that day. But what I did is I made some adjustments. I put a few talking points up on the bulletin board and eventually I didn't look at them anymore because I got more comfortable. And I said, okay, put a smile on your face just before you make the call, even though you're feeling fear, 
because you got to get over this hump and do anything you can to help induce yourself that direction. So these days, so many people, in lieu of meeting someone in person, yeah. are doing this uh, over a camera of some sort, whether it's a person on the other side or software that's doing the evaluation on the other side. And you're an expert on how uh, people and software is looking at micro expressions for um, interpreting how you really think, feel, behave. So should we start off with the actual human being or the software version? I think the actual human being, because uh, it's probably more sensitive to how it reads things, but you're going to have to deal with both potentially. Certainly the software is increasing in frequency and we should talk about that in AI before we get done here. But yeah, let's go ahead and start with the, the, uh, the, the Zoom call, the virtual you know, interview meeting. So Zoom, Teams, WebEx, whatever it is, um, an interview has been scheduled. Uh, do you want the person waiting there first? to be admitted into the room? Do you want to keep the other person waiting for them? <laughs> um, I guess I was raised in Minnesota and we have the expression Minnesota nice syndrome. So I have no problem with being the person waiting and not assuming the power position if I'm the supplicant, the job applicant. Uh, I kind of expect that the person interviewing me is quote unquote busy or wants to assume the power position and they're going to join last minute. To me, that's not the most important thing. The important thing is making the connection and seeing if you have a fit. So I, I can survive that dynamic, however it's, it's played by whomever. I'm a believer that you want to be the person waiting for the interviewer. Well, I think that's, so, the, poli that's the polite and sort of nice thing to do. Yeah. Correct. So now you're being connected. Walk, walk us through the behaviors and how someone should be expressing themselves um, from a face perspective, from a body perspective, given the fact that we're only seeing to yeah. mid chest, you know, mid of, middle of the top of, of the chest, let's say, excuse me, folks, I'm going to use that word, to the nipple uh, okay. uh, on most camera views. Um, yeah. So well, the, the, the first thing is, is think about it as a big arc that goes like that. In other words, our attention span in any session tends to be really high at the start, and it comes back at the end because we're wondering what's the close and I'm almost done with this. And is there a parting last word? But that means that, you know, that old cliche, there's not a second chance to make a first impression really does matter. Uh, don't try to fake it because there's actually, we should talk about this. There are ways in which we can detect whether it's a real smile or not a real smile. But if you can possibly get there, and if you're the job search person and you have fought and fought your way to an interview, you should be somewhat happy or at least hoping to be happy. So to put out a nice smile at the start is fabulous because a smile is basically the business equivalent or the emotional equivalent of an open for business sign, you know, whether it's a neon sign or otherwise in the front window of your store. Um, it's saying I am taking in customers. I want to connect. I want to make things happen. Let's have a transaction here. So I, I think you have to show the smile. I mean, just it's pro forma, but you got to do it. And hopefully it's a good one and a real one. I think you have to lean in a little bit, not, not to quote Sheryl Sandberg, but yes, I think you have to lean in and show you're, you're moving forward. You're moving toward this occasion. Uh, you're not sitting back in some haughty manner. You're not totally lacking in energy. Uh, I, I, you know, if I'm hiring someone, I want a reasonably happy camper. I don't want them to be a you know, happy moron, but I want them to be a happy camper I can work with. And I want them to not be a lump of coal, you know, once they come to the company. When I would coach people about in-person interviews, I always spoke about the beginning as being important. Uh, yep. Greeting someone with that big, friendly smile. Yep. And as you start talking and answering the question, to also have that smile, but let it blend to serious. So yeah. they see you have multiple personalities. It's harder to do it the other way around. You know, start off serious and then work to the big smiling person. Yeah, because it looks more fake. And um, yes, you, you're getting into the meat of the conversation. But I mean, in terms of a, a smile, it's really important to not come across as glib. I, I remember 
you know, some people I interviewed for jobs and if they just smiled all the way through, it was like, I'm actually investing real money in you. I got training time. And you have to remember that happiness obviously has its upside. It means you are, you know, open to consideration. You're good at brainstorming. You're good at collaboration. You're an upbeat person. The downside to happiness is that you, you don't pay attention to the details. You don't take things seriously enough. So I think you're absolutely right. As you get into the substance of the interview and the details of what the job's like and what you need to bring to the job and all of that, come back with some smiles by all means to show the openness to being a good teammate. But it's not a problem at all that that's not going to be as prevalent. But don't just glad hand your way through the whole interview like this is a breeze. I, I've got this. I, that's not going to have any credibility. That's not going to make me if I'm interviewing someone, it's not going to make me think that I've got a serious candidate who's really going to be an asset to the company. I, I'm afraid I've got a showboat, uh, a, a no-show, <laughs> I mean, a whole host of problems. And for those of you who are at a manager level and above, the notion that you're going to sit there with a eating smile on your face for, for a half hour or so yeah. is ridiculous. Now, yeah. the expectation is for those of you who manage direct or the VP level and above, you gotta be tough at times. So they wanna see those qualities in you expressed through your face, your tone of voice, your manner that allow them to see different dimensions of your personality. Am I wrong about that? You are totally right. And let me actually add to an element there. Um, so I've in another book of mine called Two Cheers for Democracy, uh, how emotions drive leadership style. I went through and I looked at all of the US presidents and I compared their emoting to how the presidential scholars have evaluated their effectiveness in office. And perhaps even more appropriate to this conversation about interviews, I looked at the US presidential debates held since Kennedy Nixon, all of them, and compared the data to the week after results on the ratings for the candidates from the Gallup polls. And so my suggestion actually involving happiness is twofold. One is if at all possible at the start of the interview, get to what's called a true smile. And a true smile doesn't just involve the muscles around the mouth, it also involves the twinkle in the eye. It is some joy, some delight. I really want this job. I remember hiring a woman because she emailed me back with a correction, a typo she saw on my website half an hour after the interview. There wasn't in fact a typo there. I was appalled. I fixed it immediately, but it told me she really wanted the job. And I hired her and she was one of my best workers ever. So if you have that extra edge of delight, of joy, let it shine early on, let it bring it. The other thing I really saw from the presidential debates is I ended up calling it the golden blend. And the golden blend, which Reagan did well, which Clinton did well, uh, both of whom had either time in Hollywood or good friends in Hollywood and do something about acting was that the golden blend was both happiness and slight anger, muted anger, but anger there. And the reason why I call it the golden blend, because the happiness seemed to convey that you were a winner, that you were upbeat, optimistic, you were going to go after things, collaborate, be open to suggestions, all of those wonderful aspects. But the slight anger, like the, the pursing of the lips, for instance, the narrowing of the eyes, not out of control anger, but a sense of purpose. Because if, for instance, you're running for president, you want to say, I will bring this all there, so I'm open and collaborative, and I have the intent, the plan, the drive to make it happen on behalf of us. And that's why I called it the golden blend and it pulled well, and it's gonna pull well for you in your very minor focus group called the two or three people or the one person interviewing you. You should really be looking for it. And I'm thinking on tough interview questions where you know you got it, bringing the smile back on your face at that moment to let them know, you thought this was tough, I got this one. You know, so the smile comes back on and they can see that that you're able to gracefully and effortlessly swat it away <laughs> becomes a way of demonstrating confidence. Yeah. And you're going to say something to the contrary. <laughs> no, I'm not, but I'm going to add to it actually, because one of the things I've seen in people like Tom Brady and Bill Gates and others is yeah, they'll smile, but they'll actually also smirk. They will show contempt because if it comes with a smile, contempt can be, yeah, I got this. Uh, I'm superior, 
I, you know, I'm not going to get ruffled. I can move through this. You know, I'm at the top of my game and I'm the kind of person you should be hiring. On the other hand, if the contempt comes with anger, and, and I think he's a, a great artist, may not be my music exactly, but Prince right here from the Twin Cities, he showed contempt often because he tangled with the record companies for one thing. And there's something called racism out there in society. And then really? can, yeah, just, you know, a news flash for all of your listeners. But he would show anger along with the contempt. And uh, it's nothing against hiring someone who's African American by any stretch of the imagination whatsoever. However, if I saw it in a white person, black person, Asian person, anybody, I would tell you that contempt and anger suggest something probably a little more volatile because contempt, a smirk, can also suggest. I'm above you. I'm superior to you. I don't trust you. And trust is the emotion of business. And you are going to have to try to cobble this together. It's tough, but you're going to have to cobble this together as manager, employee, or with teammates. And so someone who comes in and has already got a disposition to be contemptuous and, you know, angry, pissed off about it, that's probably a powder keg that's going to be a little difficult to deal with. So contempt with a smile, a smile and a smirk, fabulous contempt I, I, and a negative emotion i think you're in more difficult territory when i coach people about interviewing i always start off by telling them confidence is only one thing that they're looking for yep there are a lot of confident people they look for self-confidence character some people want to hire people who are characters <laughs> in sales roles <laughs> generally they want to hire people who yeah. have character i can demonstrate yeah. it so confidence, self-confidence, character, chemistry, maybe a little bit of charisma, because charismatic people always do better on interviews than non-charismatics, which yeah. disadvantages introverts generally who don't project US-centric self-confidence. Yeah. But it all adds up to they want to trust the person that they hire. Yes. Yes. That's the formula for trust. Yeah. Think. And so if trust is the emotion of business, contempt is its opposite. I think you can get away with it when it's a smile, particularly in a tough gotcha question where you can show that you can ride through it. It's the fourth quarter, you're down by two touchdowns, but you're going to win this interview. I think that's great. But there's one really important thing to bear in mind here. For most people on average, I've been doing facial coding for 20 years across like 25, 40 countries. I mean, I, I have witnessed a whole lot of people. And most of us, about 70% of our emoting is happiness or anger. Those are both approach emotions. I want to hug you. I want to hit you. All of the other emotions, sadness and fear and disgust and contempt, uh, those are, and surprise, those are kind of the accent emotions. They, they're the other 30% of the game. That's why the golden blend is so important because that is where the most of the game gets played is, is happiness and anger and blending them, but tilting a bit toward the happiness without avoiding or skewing the, the anger is just really the great place to go. So yeah, I think a little bit of contempt is, is maybe even helpful to the cause if you feel it and it's there, but don't overplay that part. Because, yes, it all comes back to trust and contempt starts to really muddy the waters on whether trust is going to be feasible. And then we have software versions of yeah. evaluation. Uh, and we're not going to talk about any particular product. Sure. Because uh, we don't want to necessarily uh, provide a roadmap. We want to you know, provide an overall impression of yeah. how to respond when software is doing the evaluation and what it tends to look for in the way of micro expressions that allow it to believe it's interpreting or the yeah. programming suggests that it's interpreting it for the right behaviors. So how does one express themselves on camera when there's no other person there? It's just a piece of software recording an answer. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to get to an answer to that, but I'm going to set up a little bit of context for, for wow. listeners and viewers first. So we all know that artificial intelligence is coming on, and it's coming on strong. Uh, the estimations about how many job displacements is one factor. Another one is what's the skill set you're actually going to want to have on the job? You're increasingly going to be someone who actually, just like we learned how to type and be on computers in the 80s and the 90s, by later part of the 20s and into the 2030s, you're going to have to be someone who basically doesn't necessarily have a teammate. You've got a computer system 
you're working with. You got AI that you were working with. And it will mean that your emotional intelligence, which is really what I focus on in my, my studies and books and so forth, that's going to become really important because it differentiates you. It allows you to add value to do things that the software can't do. So that's one piece of my background. The other one is, yes, facial coding is part of what you alluded to in the introduction, which is it's part of the emerging facial industrial complex, as The Economist magazine called it. There's a reason for that. Facebook, uh, not surprisingly, but also Microsoft, Google, Apple, uh, a Chinese company that's valued into the billions, they are all automating facial coding. So they are not nearly as good as they need to be yet. Uh, easier is face recognition and even that software uh, in a racist sense, I'm sad to say, sometimes mistakes black people for apes for not even being human. That, that's how much the software still needs to improve itself. So you can imagine that the automated facial coding software <clears throat> has its problems when it comes to accurately distinguishing between the seven emotions I mentioned a bit ago. There's a really much easier barometer that they can probably handle, however, that's instrumental to you doing well in those kinds of evaluations. And we haven't talked about it yet. And that's the engagement level. Simply whether or not you emote versus you have a poker face or a failure to have any affect to emote. Why is this so important? Because we emote, we show that something matters to us. If you go back to Latin, Motivation and emotion have the same root word, movere, to move, to make something happen. As a small business owner, do I want my employees to make something happen, to get something done other than just pocket the paycheck? Absolutely. I don't want the person who shows up and couldn't care less, that they don't have any stakes in the game. And so regardless of which emotions you're showing, just the fact that you're showing emotions is a really key barometer. And the software to date tends to kind of pick up on every slight little nuance. So it's kind of over-reporting the data, but it's most definitely reporting the data and you need to show up on the radar screen. You prompted me to now add another C to my formula. It's competence, self-confidence, character, chemistry, charisma, care. Yeah, you care. care. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for that. I've, I've told people for years, but this is a part of it, but I hadn't worked into the formula until you now spoke. So uh, it's, it's recognizing emotions, probably over-interpreting it now, uh, but it'll, it'll get closer to being right with yeah. time uh, as there's more machine learning going on. Yeah, for, for instance, when I, when, yeah, because I started applying facial coding into business before it was just done by the CIA and the FBI uh, um, and in psychology and in academia, that's where it was. So I brought it into business starting in 1998. Uh, the automators, once they realized I had a business going, uh, followed suit around about, starting about 2004 or five. Uh, I first tested some of the systems about 2010. They were about 35% accurate. Now they're about 50% accurate. So they're gonna keep moving in that direction. And it's absolutely essential that people recognize that this is coming on and it's gonna be a real filter, not just what you can type in a, into a form, and how you come across, uh, whether it's virtual, in person, Zoom call, whatever. I want to go back to one emotion I mentioned. No, I, want, I want to go back to that, but I just want to add, check one sure, thing sure. with you. Do, do hand gestures get picked up on by the software as, as an expression, as a person expressing themselves? And, and for those of you who are going to watch this on YouTube or Amazon, you'll see me, I'm using my hands as I'm talking. Does it pick up on that or does it just stick to the face? Um, let me first go to, to hand gestures and why they're tricky. Uh, I lived in Italy as a boy. We lived on the Italian Riviera, you know, tough break. Uh, and uh, all the traffic, we come back from the French Riviera on Sunday, and you can see the drivers, you, I don't know if you can see this hand gesture, but going do, 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 they're, they're, they're raising their hand. Uh, I'm not showing it well, but anyway, they're raising their hand in kind of a version of giving you the bird. And it, meant, it did not mean I love you, most definitely, as they're sitting in traffic. The problem with hand gestures is they're affected by culture and by gender in terms of our body displays. And so they're, they're not universal in the way that facial expressions are. 
And so my belief is that most of the software is really focusing uh, in the region from essentially, you know, the chin up to the eyebrows. Uh, it's, been called, it's been called the 25 most valuable square inches of real estate in the world. <laughs> because in the face, we, we have four of our five senses, everything but touch. Uh, we, we, it signifies your, your beauty or attractiveness, handsomeness. It gives us a sense, obviously, of your race and gender and age. Um, so there are so many other things going on. It's really the, the signpost, the signifier, the billboard for who we are. But th that's the part of the real estate that makes sense. And, and the hand gestures are, are less complete. You really have pretty much, you can put it into the categories of whether you're uh, more assertive, more submissive, uh, more kind of open, but maybe even hapless a bit. It, it's really much more limited than what the face can give you. Thank you. I interrupted you as you were going to go back to a different emotion. Well, there was one emotion I, I mentioned earlier in this interview that I think really is important and it's a subtle emotion. So I, I'm really afraid that the software probably doesn't pick it up really well so far. And, and that's sadness. So probably the most reliable way that we show sadness is that the eyebrows arch together, but they lift in the middle. Uh, we just had the commemoration of the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And in fact, I was supposed to be in one of the Twin Towers that morning for a meeting with American Express. And it got canceled because a key person couldn't make the meeting. So I, I'm really happy to be here talking with you, Jeff, because I would have been in one of those buildings. I don't remember what floor we were on. But in the commemoration for 9-11 with the firemen and so forth, I, I saw some heartbreaking instances of photographs where you had those eyebrows pulled together and upward in the middle, a really reliable sign of sadness. The other ways can be like a little wince in the cheek, for instance. But here's why, and I mentioned this book earlier, this is why sadness is so important. When I looked at the U.S. presidents, their effectiveness in office, and what the uh, U.S. historians, presidential historians said about that, the single strongest correlation to being ineffective in the job was sadness. Interesting. Because, again, it slows you down. <laughs> it makes you listless, drop out, and so forth. Now, obviously, being the president of the United States is probably the most stressful job on the planet or among them. But every worker has more coming at them these days than they would care to shake a stick at. Jobs are complicated. We multitask and so forth. So that, you know, sadness, the upside is it makes you ponder things. Uh, Lincoln showed sadness, but he also showed happiness. He had a rueful sense of humor. He made fun of himself with self-depreciating jokes and so forth. So he, to my mind, extracted the best out of sadness, which is you can reflect on things, you can ponder, you don't want to rush into the next mistake. And it can be tremendously helpful for things like empathy. So I'm, I'm not trying to give a bum rap to sadness, but once again, it slows you down. And I think an interviewer could be really terrified that they've got somebody who's a slow poke that they're going to hire. So I think you want to emote to show energy and you probably want to stay away from sadness Unless the question is specifically around your talents at being inclusive, being a good teammate, being a good listener, then I think it's a wonderful thing to bring out, actually, because it's really the emotion of empathy. That's, that's its, its long suit. And it's interesting. Often I see that expressed through slowing down speech. Yeah. And, and in slowing down speech... You know, one of the things I coach people about is how that often conveys sincerity. Uh, so yeah, yeah, that's how it gets interpreted. Yeah, no, I'm, you know, I mentioned earlier someone who just smiles all the way through the interview can come across as too glib and not very invested in the job. Yeah, that's where I think sadness can su suggest some, some weight, you know, some substance to who you are. So, again, no emotion is all positive or all negative. You know, it's a little more multifaceted than that. But I, I think that, you know, we, we tend to worry about, you know, someone who's blue, <laughs> you know, and, and so forth. So I, I think you got to be careful with it in a job interview. Uh, but, you know, if we get to onboarding, we can discuss that. But just in general, there are certainly positive attributes to sadness. What haven't we covered yet about interviewing that we should? Because we only have a few more minutes left uh, for content. Sure. I, I think the key here is we, we didn't mention one other emotion. I think we've hit practically all of them except for disgust, which is kind of like contempt and an aversive rejection emotion. 
but surprise, because you earlier brought up kind of the gotcha questions. And, and one recourse with that was to have the smile and the smirk and suggest you can just ride through it. But you might be genuinely caught flat footed by a question and you need a moment. I, I think one of the great things to do is to ask them to repeat the question or repeat the comment. It buys you time because surprise, you know, the mouth drops open, the eyes go wide, you're like taking like, oh my God, that's what they're asking me? The, the, yeah, exactly like that. The good news is that it, it tends to be a really brief expression. Almost all expressions are, are quite brief. Uh, anger might, you know, flare and last a while. Contempt can be kind of attitudinal and stay on the face. But a lot of expressions, particularly surprised, are in that, you know, you use the term micro expression, really brief. So if you're lucky, they don't really notice the surprise or you can quickly you know, throw even an artificial smile on it to, to soften the blow a bit. But you need to get out of the surprise and you move to, need to move on to thinking about how you're gonna handle it. And yeah, that's my number one idea. Uh, ask them to clarify, repeat, give you an example of what they're talking about. Get them to talk, switch the spotlight back on them. They're now gonna be, as the interviewer, caught up in their own you know, words and how they wanna formulate that and it buys you some time. Um, if you're on the other side and you're really caught by surprise by what the interview subject said, I think you have more license to just admit you're surprised and say, do I understand you right? Did you just say X <laughs> and, and stay with it? Because the surprises you get in the interview might be a little bit disturbing, but the surprises you get after they take the job, <laughs> those can really ruin your life. Surprises are never good, no matter where you are in this formula. <laughs> Uh, generally speaking, there, there can be a wonderful surprise. Like, oh, yeah, I've got that talent. You know, I, I've done that before. Oh, that's what you need next on the job. Um, so there can be some wonderful surprises. I say of surprise, it's like the following. Uh, I got a new car for Christmas. That's wonderful. Uh, I had a new car accident on the way home from work. That's not wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, the new car is great. So actually, I do think there's an upside to surprise, even in an interview. Uh, but yes, once you're on the job, you, you hope they, they settle in, they got a groove, they're a good fit, the competencies all match. Uh, yeah, you, you want probably fewer surprises as things go along. Excellent. Dan, this is, as it was on our first interview with one another a few years ago, a lot of fun. How can people find out more about you, the work that you do, the book, blah, 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 <laughs> a snarky guy to all this lingo, which is a lot of fun, folks. Well, How can people thank, find out more about you? Yeah, yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, I guess there's the website, of course, the obligatory three W's and sensorylogic.com. It's the name of my company. I have things about my books, my, my podcast on the New Books Network called Dan Hill's EQ Spotlight. Uh, all sorts of things like that are there. Uh, but you can also, if you want, blah, 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 or I alluded to the book, Two Cheers for Democracy, or my book on EQ that's called uh, Famous Faces Decoded. They're all on Amazon, of course. Dan, thank you. And folks, we'll be back soon with more. I'm Jeff Altman, The Big Game Hunter. I've got a lot of great information on my website, thebiggamehunter.us. You can go to the blog, go exploring, order courses from me that I have available. There's just a lot of great information that will help you. Also, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com forward slash high end forward slash Big Game Hunter. Mention that you saw the interview with Dan or listen to it. I like knowing that I'm helping some folks. And I'll also say that I have a, a Tuesday and Friday LinkedIn Live where I answer questions from people. If you have questions about job search, hiring more effectively, managing and leading, send an email to me. Uh, and you send it to thebiggamehunter at gmail.com. In the subject line, put the phrase office hours. Uh, this way I know what it's about. I'll get to answering your questions. Have a terrific day, folks. And most importantly, be great. Take care.